Meanwhile, pushing for the 51st state, the House passed a bill yesterday which would grant Washington, D.C. statehood. It faces an uphill battle in the Senate, where Majority Leader Chuck Schumer has not committed to bringing it up for a vote. Joining me right now is former Utah Congressman, House Oversight and Reform Committee Chairman and Fox News contributor Jason Chaffetz. Jason, it's great to see you this morning. Thanks so much for being here. So much policy to Thanks. talk about with you. Let's first begin with the 51st statehood idea. Do you think this goes through? Uh, I don't. They tried this in 2009. They passed it in the House, but the Senate didn't take it up. The root of this is uh, whether or not they can uh, override the filibuster, which they can't unless they change the rules. But if they overchange the filibuster, they're going to pack the courts. They're going to add D.C. statehood, probably Puerto Rico, some others along the way. Without that, I don't think there's any way they can get to the to the 60 vote threshold. And then I think ultimately the courts would rule it unconstitutional because it is unconstitutional. So, so it all comes down to two senators, Senator Joe Manchin and Kristen Sinema, to stop them from pushing through ending the filibuster then. Is that what this is all about? If they are able to end the filibuster, which is a requirement of 60 votes, and then they just need 50 votes, with Kamala Harris being the majority and the 51st, uh, they could get through everything they want. H.R. 1, which changes voting laws, uh, statehood for D.C., uh, higher taxes, uh, really everything they want, packing the court as well. Yeah, that, that, that is the fear, is that uh, by rolling through the filibuster, normally through what's called, um, they have to get to a 60-vote threshold uh, in order to break cloture and, and be able to move on in a, and look at a bill. Unlike the House, the Senate can only take up one issue at a time, and so they have to reach that threshold. That's why so, many, so few bills go through the process. But, you know, they have threatened to block, to, to override that filibuster. But you're right, uh, Kristen Sinema out, out of Arizona uh, and uh, Mr. Manchin there, Senator Manchin out of West Virginia, have been the two that have held the line and the Senate tradition that has been there for more than 100 years. Well, they're talking about all of this being civil rights related. I mean, let's, let's take a look at this whole agenda, Jason. Are there any bills or laws or pieces of the Biden agenda that you believe are actually helpful to the American people? No, at this point. I mean, the whole promise of Joe Biden, he was going to return us to this point where we were actually going to work together and he was going to reach across the aisle and find bipartisan solutions. But in the first hundred days, I mean, can you find a single thing? I mean, he makes Donald Trump look like the most bipartisan president we have had uh, in generations. Um, but Joe Biden's promise of bringing people and uniting people is a fallacy, and uh, he's never done it throughout his history of his time in the Senate. I don't know why we thought he was going to do it now, but that was the story that uh, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris put together uh, for the campaign, and I think America liked it. The problem is they just never do it. So I don't see any piece of legislation that is helpful to the economy. I don't see any piece of legislation that is bipartisan in any way, shape, or form. Yeah, the journal this morning in one of the op-eds I read earlier wrote this whole moderate Joe was a myth from the beginning, but the media tried to play Joe Biden as some moderate uh, in the face of the extremists on the left. I mean, the media has enabled so much of this. Look at the border crisis and what Politico did yesterday. Politico denying the border crisis, and they wrote a memo, the leadership writes a memo, telling its staff not to use the term crisis. In articles, this uh, internal memo was was uh, was received by the Washington Examiner, and it reads, "Quote: While the sharp increase in the arrival of unaccompanied minors is a problem for border officials, a political challenge for the Biden administration, and a dire situation for many migrants who make the journey, it does not fit the dictionary definition of a crisis." Can you imagine? I mean, you've got infants being thrown over an 18-foot wall. You've got little girls getting sexually abused on their trek over to the border. You've got smugglers and cartels demanding $5,000 a head uh, for your kid and renting children so that it could look like these people, young men, are actually fathers and families uh, to get into this country. And yet Politico is telling their staffs that it 
doesn't meet the dictionary definition of a crisis, Jason. It's further proof that the media is hand in glove with the radical far left um, agenda. And there are some legal reasons why uh, they're trying not to call it a crisis. I think they're afraid of some injunctive relief uh, as the states sue the federal government. This goes back to the Obama Biden administration, where they changed the definition of credible fear and they did so unilaterally without legislation. That changed the scope on which people could claim asylum. Um, Donald Trump fixed all this. It was plugging the border and had a good policy in place. And of course, as soon as Biden and Harris get there, they reverse that. But they're they're afraid of this injunctive relief if it is a crisis and the states can argue, hey, listen, we have to fix this and fix this immediately because you can't unilaterally change the definition of credible fear, which obviously yeah. it started in Obama and Biden has continued. Well, the media is also playing up this tax increase plan as if it's just going to impact the top 1%, which is so wrong. If you're going to overturn Donald Trump's tax cut plan, you are that in and of itself raising taxes on everyone because every level of income saw a tax cut in 2017. So we've got the capital gains tax hike here. The White House considering nearly doubling that tax rate to 39.6 percent. When you talk about wealthier investors, federal rates could creep as high as 43.4 percent. Those making more than a million dollars a year, states like New York and California, could see rates inching closer to 60 percent. Jason, the media keeps saying it's taxing the rich. Everyone is seeing their tax increases. Everyone will see their taxes go higher, every income level, if you're overturning the Trump tax cuts. Your reaction? That's exactly right. Every single person in this country will get a tax increase. And, and they've done so in part because of the inflation, which is so cruel to lower incomes. Uh, but they're also, I mean, they, they are... It's almost as if they don't want the economy to succeed because it was moving. Look what they did on and the energy sector. I mean, prices, if you're on a fixed income, if you're having to commute to work and the energy prices go, go up radically, uh, that harms you and is a tax into itself. But the actual taxes, let's remember what, what Bernie Sanders said about Joe Biden. He will be the most progressive president in the history of the United States. And in the first 100 days, that's exactly what he's doing. Right. Yes, he is. All right, Jason. Great to get your insights. Come back soon. Thank you, sir. Jason Chaffetz joining us this Thank morning. You.